Hi, I'm Carrie Corbett Owen, and welcome to Coffee with Carrie. Today, I'm honoring Dr. Mario Martinez, founder of the Biocognitive Institute, for the role of his research and how it helped me write my latest book. Hi, Mario. Hello. Well, good. I'm glad we finally connected here. For those of you who haven't met Dr. Martinez, you're in for a treat today. This man has been a hero of mine for many years, ever since I discovered his book, The Mind-Body Code, which if you haven't read it, you just have to. It will change your paradigm and how you think about life. But not only is he a best-selling author, he's a scientist, he's a psychologist, he's a musician, and he's also a fabulous artist. So when I give you his details of his Biocognitive Institute and you go and check it out, look under shop and you'll see some of his incredible work that he's done from his early music to his current art and his magnificent books. So Murray, I wanted to kick off today by reading you a very short excerpt from The Mind Body Code, and then we'll just leap right into it if that's okay with you. Yes, of course. Thank Great. you for having me. Thank you. So you said, I was taught to identify pathology, to confirm a model that interprets life as a constant struggle to maintain health and battle illness. Then you go on to say, I was trained in a world where gerontologists study the pathology of aging rather than the wellness of growing older and where the pharmaceutical industry entices healthcare providers to believe the delusion that we are mere biochemical beings and the hapless victims of our genes. So I know from reading many of your books and watching many of your interviews that you've changed that bit of training a lot. So tell me what you believe now. <clears throat> Even more uh, <laughs> of what I believed before, uh, because what, what happened, the best way to explain it is uh, to see how, where things come from. What happened with biology is that in order to become a legitimate science, because at first it was very speculative and uh, there was a time that, uh, that you couldn't even do autopsies, you couldn't open the body. So there was a lot of speculation. So it's not to criticize it, but to see where it comes from. So biology, in order to legitimize itself, it had to borrow Newtonian physics to explain movement and explain all these other things that are necessary. And Newtonian physics is very reductionistic. And it works really well with mechanical things, with planets and um, material things. But we are more than that, we're self-organizing, self-replicating systems. And although part of us is Newtonian, for example, the heart is a pump. That's a, it's a, a mechanical process, but the heart is more than, than, than a, uh, a pump. It communicates with the uh, different parts of the body, communicates with the brain. It has uh, its own regulating hormones. Uh, it's like an endocrine gr uh, gland. Uh, when you say something that uh, someone likes, the heart will produce uh, hormones that are uh, immune enhancing. So it's much more than that. So I saw the limitations of, of the Newtonian model and thought that we needed to go to the next step. And the next step is complexity theory. Complexity theory is, is much more than, than the reductionist uh, model of Newtonian. So for example, in Newtonian, when they look at entropy, the process of things moving in one, from one place to another in time, they say, well, uh, things go from order to disorder. So they impose that on gerontology. And they say, well, if you start here, you're in order. Then as you grow older, it's going to be disorder. And it doesn't work that way. So they study then the disorder of growing older by the model. In complexity theory, the entropy or the, the equivalent of the entropy would be that you are you go from simplicity to complexity. So you don't deteriorate, you become more complex. At some point, the body breaks down, of course, and we die and all that, but, but a 40-year-old uh, a brain is much more developed and complex than a, than a five-year-old brain. So we go to that complexity. So that changes the whole model because in it, then I bring anthropology and anthropology says, well, we've been around as homo sapiens for over 150,000 years. Trial and error and what works, trial and error and what works. So then what I argue is that longevity is learned, is culturally learned, it's not genetics, it's only 20%. And the causes of health are inherited, but they need to be triggered. So that changes the whole paradigm, as you were saying. 
And that gives us an idea of why I'm going in that direction, not with a Newtonian reductionism. So Mario, one of the reasons that I wanted to interview you is because it's a way of honoring the authors that have informed some of the work in my book, um, Your Body Song. And in you, one of the things I mentioned from your work is cultural portals and how they put us in these boxes and define how we think. And one of the things I so often hear from my friends, you know, I'll get an email and they'll talk about as part of the natural aging process, blah, blah, blah. What would you say to that? Well, the portals, briefly explain the portals, is the cultural constraints that are put on, on age. Uh, one portal is infancy, then there's child, then there's adolescent, young adult, middle age, especially middle age is very important. And then uh, senior citizen or, or old age. Those are culturally imposed parameters that don't exist in nature. They don't exist. Um, when you, uh, middle age, what does that mean? When I ask the centenarian, what's middle age? They say, I don't know, I'll find out when I die. So they don't have those parameters. They live outside of the portals. The problem with the portals is they have their own speed, their own expectations, their own language, and their own attribution to things, what you attribute to things. So if you are 20 and you go from one room to the other and you forget what we're doing, you forget, you just let it go and it comes. If you're 70, oh, Alzheimer's, you give interpretation to the same thing. And then that idea, the language is so important because the language will affect your biology. So for example, you're 70 and you get lost, like people get lost. And you go, oh, there's, there, there, it is, there it is, there's dementia. What is that doing to your body? It's creating hormones that begin to affect the hippocampus, which has to do with memory. So what you're saying to yourself is you're creating the expectation by the stress hormones that you're creating. So for example, if uh, the other day I, uh, I went from the kitchen to the bathroom and I couldn't remember what I was looking for. So there's a tendency to, oh, what's going on here? So I said, okay, let me use neuropsychology here. I go to where I started because you, the information starts in one place. And then you start thinking about other things and you, and you, begin, you get uh, distracted and you forget. So what I did is I went back to the kitchen and said, oh, go into the bathroom to pick up a, a towel. That's it. <clears throat> and then you, you defy the myth of aging. There is some deterioration, but very minor, uh, because time doesn't do anything. Time is an affordance of space. When people say time heals, time doesn't do anything. It's what you do in space that heals or doesn't. So if time is an affordance, then it doesn't matter how old you are. It's what you've done with the time and space, not how old you are. So when you say that, I think a lot about, you know, the research that you and I both talk about with um, Dr. Ellen Langer, you know, where she took a yes. group of elderly men to the monastery and in one week they reversed all their biological markers just by being a younger person. So it was almost as if their consciousness informed their biology. Yes, because what happened with Ellen, <clears throat> Ellen is a, is a, is a great uh, researcher and, and a good friend. She's at Harvard and uh, she was the first female to be tenured in the psychology department. She's done some really simple but elegant uh, experiments. And the difference is that she divided a group of men in their 80s. This was back uh, about 20 years ago. <clears throat> um, and she put them in two conditions. Uh, there was a place with little villas and where they stayed. And one group, they told them, you're coming here. We'll give you a name tag. And you're going to be reminiscing about the good old days. So see how much you remember. Okay, that's one group. The other group, they told them, you're going to be living as if you were in the past. You bring a a tag with your name, with a picture of you 20, 30 years ago. You're not gonna see anything other than 20 uh, years ago, the uh, I love Lucy or whatever uh, at those 20, 30 years. And that's all they did. And they said, you can't talk beyond a certain uh, year. So you're gonna be in a, in a time capsule for a week. And they looked at the markers, as you said, uh, the so-called aging markers. Uh, and they looked at uh, sleep and gait and strength of grip, uh, one-pointed vision, uh, a lot of things. And they were so impressed with the people that were living, they were embodying, you, you don't, if you don't embody, it doesn't work. The people that were embodying it by living it, 
that they called in some um, some outside raiders and they asked them to raid pictures. So picture of day one and day six were uh, juxtaposed so that it would look like one was before and the one. That, and they asked, what, what is the age difference in these people? They said anywhere from eight to 10 years. When they came in, they were, they were in the portal of the old man with a bag walking and talking. Oh, where do I put my bag? Well, you have to take your bag up. Oh, I can't do it. Well, you're going to have to do it. That's it. Uh, that's how they were. When they were leaving, they were playing touch football. An aging, now here's the problem. And, and I've talked to Ellen about many of these things. And you know, a, a research at the beginning can't cover everything. So what happened is that they assume that those gains were gonna last. When they went back, they were put back into the portal of the grandpa. Uh, grandpa, let me get, get you some coffee. No, I'll get it myself. No, 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 I'll get it for you. Within six months, they lost all the gains. So several lessons here. You have to embody your reality and you have to come out, you have to get out of the portal and not allow others to put you back in the portal because the, the, the culture will work very hard to put you in the portal. So you have to live portalless in order to do that. So that's a great example. And part of what you're saying is not only do you have to live portalless, but you have to live agelessness. Can yes. You... Well, because if you um, if, if you say you're 30, immediately you're pegged and you're gonna be treated in one particular way. Even when you go to the doctor, if you go to an emergency room at 90, you're gonna be treated differently than if you're 20. At 90, well, you've been around, well, what, what do you want? And, and, and not that they're not gonna take care of you, but there's a mindset already that's saying you've lived a long time. So the attention is different. The impression is different. Not that they don't take care of you, but to take care of you with a different mindset. So in, in those portals, what happens is you have a language. So when somebody says, uh, you're 50, oh, you look great for your age, which means you shouldn't look that great. Or if they say, oh, you look older, well, that's bad. Either way you lose. But the problem is that they're trying to peg you to see how they're going to treat you based on the pegging rather than how long you've been around. And that has a biological effect. The places in Europe, countries that will give you, the social service will give you a cane because eventually you're going to need it. And eventually you start walking with a cane. So those are the cultural sculptors that we have that, that will create a biology based on cultural beliefs rather than how the biology should go. Why do I know this? Because I worked with hundreds of centenarians all over the world who are healthy. And when I first started working with them, I thought, well, it's got to be genetics. It's got to be the Methuselah uh, gene. And all. No, it's none of that. Uh, it's, it's not the telomeres. They have long telomeres, short telomeres. What it is, is the mindset that they have, the way they live the world. Some are vegetarians, some eat meat, some are vegans, very few vegans, by the way. Uh, so it's not what you do, but how you perceive what you do. Yes. I was very fortunate, Maria, to grow up um, with a centenarian in our home. My grandfather oh. lived to 101. And so you know, and when I listen to your interviews, I can just see him and how he was. For example, you know, when he ate his porridge in the morning, he had a ritual. I mean, he literally would take this bowl and he would spoon his porridge up and he'd let it cool. And then he'd grate cheese on it. You know, cholesterol is very bad for your health apparently, but he was a dietitian's nightmare. He just loved everything he ate. And he would put honey yes. and he would put muesli on it and then he would put a big dollop of cream on it and he'd spoon it all in and he ate with such joy you know and, and i think that joy changes your biology oh no of course it does uh and and what he was doing is a typical thing that centenarians do they have rituals and rituals are one of the causes of health but they're flexible a centenarian would be a vegetarian and they would they're vegetarian because they choose by joy not by fear and you invite them to a barbecue and they'll eat the meat. Then they're not, uh, they're not uh, uh, Nazis of, of, of the thoughts. <laughs> you know, they're, they, they're open and they're, 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 they, uh, they're flexible, but the rituals are the things that carry you throughout life. They, they, they're like the, the carpet that carries you. And they're very important because they have meaning. Yes. Uh, a routine is you have to take a shower to smell good. A ritual, is uh, you take a shower and you do it slowly 
and you have the symbolism of what you're doing and you bring in good thoughts about the smell of that, all of that. One is function and the other one's meaning. So you, I, yeah, I think you're right. You, you for example, could have uh, a glass of wine by yourself feeling lonely and you get a headache the next day. You have two glasses of wine with family and friends and people who love you, you're fine the next day because it's contextual. Now, if you abuse wine, of course, but within the limits, the context is very important, the meaning is very important, and the joy is very important. If you eat tofu out of fear and McDonald's out of joy, you're going to live longer with McDonald's. <laughs> well, you know, I think you're right because um, I was listening to a CNN um, interview with the doctor of Emma Marana, who died at 117. And, you know, he was saying she ate two raw eggs every day. Um, she ate a lot of candy. And then he paused as if very puzzled. And he said, but she ate it with such childlike joy. Yes, and, yes. and again, you know, I think that joy changes how your body assimilates and digests and, and is able to actually use everything in your food. And so, I, I you know, centenarians, the ones that I've spoken to, don't chase down superfoods. They don't chomp on chia seeds. They're actually very relaxed eaters. Yes, yes. Well, um, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you eat junk. I'm saying that, that you eat with joy and within limits. Um, Warren Buffett in the United States, one of the wealthiest men, he's 87, 88. His uh, usual diet is Coke and, uh, and uh, potato chips. You would but think that's terrible. That. <laughs> so, but but what he, he does it with joy. So I imagine what would happen if you eat healthy food with joy. It would yeah. be even better. Yeah. <clears throat> so joy has a biology. Joy is not an emotion. It's a family of emotions. Mm -hmm. So it has a biology. Anything that you feel comes from hormones. Anything that you think comes from uh, uh, neurotransmitters. So it's all biological, but it's not just biological. It's mind-body culture interwoven. Yeah. I think that the cultural element that you bring into it, Maria, is so important because I wonder what our health would be like if we had a real health care model instead of a disease care model, because that's what we have at the moment. Yes. And we have a model based on, again, the reductionism, and, but also the normal curve. Every study is done with a normal curve. It's done with uh, analysis of variance and correlations and all about the, the, the average, not the individual. So if you fall within that average and you have an illness, they'll treat you with it. But if you fall outside of that, so for example, let's say you have an illness and they tell you, well, you have six months to live. That's bad science and that's unethical. You have to say, on the average, on the curve, people with this, with this illness live six months. On the other side of the curve, they live six weeks. But on this side of the curve, they live five years. Let's find out what these people are doing here. You know what they do with that? Those two outsiders, they call them nuisance variables and they take them out of the studies. Yeah. So, so you don't learn anything about the causes of health. You learn how to, how to palliative uh, medicine, which is how to make your symptoms more comfortable so you live longer with your symptoms with, with the least amount of discomfort. Mm -hmm. So it's not health care, it's pathology maintenance. Yeah. You had some great advice in one of your interviews for people that say, well, you know, it's in my genes. All right. <clears throat> it's true that it's in your genes to a certain degree, but genes are only a potential of expression, a potential of expression. If you don't find anybody in your, in your family, that, uh, which I find it very difficult, there's always someone you just have, to, have to look on both sides of the family. Then you find someone that could be a model for you of how to be. And it's the same thing. Because what you're finding is to break away from, the, from that uh, vicious cycle that it's all your genes. Your genes are only a potential of expression, basically triggered by what you do with your life. So let's say you find um, a centenarian who lives next to you. You begin to look at what that centenarian is doing that's different than what your family's doing. And right there, you have the model. So it doesn't have to be a genetic model, but a model that tells you there's another way of expressing my genes. And, and for example, people will say, well, look, it's very genetic because everybody in the family has this illness. Everybody in the family eats the same thing. They think the same thing. They live in the same place. So it's not just genetics. There's an epigenetics there. Very important. Yeah. You know, I um, 
I was just looking at some twin studies and what was what struck me is that yes, at birth they have very similar genes or identical genes turned on, but by age three they actually start to have different genes turned on. And by age 65, actually there's a huge variance. And not only is there a huge variance, but they seldom die from the same thing. And they actually don't often die at the same times either. And so there's right. actually a lot more dissimilarity than there is similarity when it comes to, and that's what you're saying about, you know, genes are about 20%. Yes, and you, uh, you said it very well that at first the gene expression is the same. So they're identical and every the way they think, the way, but as, as the environment interacts with them and they interpret the environment, things begin to change. The, the, this, uh, this, uh, I, I, I believe, here's another biocognitive bomb, that addictions are not, are not an illness. They're a biocultural learned dysfunction. And they always go to the uh, studies with uh, uh, twins, which are badly designed. Uh, so they look, okay, these twins, um, if, you, if you have family uh, addiction, for example, alcohol, the probability is five times as high for you to develop alcoholism. So they studied um, twins and they thought, okay, these twins, let's see what happens. They, they both developed alcoholism. Okay, there you go, there's the proof. Studies that go beyond that um, minimal mindset, they had twins that were adopted. Some were adopted in homes that had higher socioeconomics and, and serenity. The other ones, low socioeconomic and turmoil. The ones who developed the uh, alcoholism were the ones who were in the high turmoil, low socioeconomics. So much for genes. It's an expression. And that's why epigenetics is so important. Epigenetic studies, how we learn things and how we transfer things, non-DNA, by the environment having an effect and then passing it on to the next generation. So true. You know, Marius, one of the things that struck me so much about your work was that um, that medical anthropology article that you mentioned with Borchorno, where you spoke about this um, Peruvian woman and the Japanese woman. And, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons that that struck me so much, and I'm going to ask you to share the study with us, but I want to tell you what struck me about it, is that I had researched weight for 16 years. And I know that you said, you know, some centenarians can be a little bit chunky, and actually that ties in very directly with um, Catherine Flagel's work, who is the head scientist at the CDC, who shows that actually if you're slightly overweight, you have a, a more longevity, but that's beside the point. So mm -hmm. what struck me about your research was that coming from South Africa, I found a study um, done by the, the um, Royal College of London. It was one of the early studies where they found these rural African women didn't have all the same metabolic disorders as everybody else did, and yet they were obese. And yet their recommendation was still that they needed to lose weight. So I, you know, and, and for me, that was kind of, I understand rural African women because I grew up amongst them. And, you know, when you're a rural African woman, you're thought of as being fertile, being beautiful, not having AIDS. So you're a healthy, on, and you're honored and revered for being overweight. And so how does that yeah. change, change our biology, be feeling honored and revered? Uh, well, because the, the culture will determine the, the, eth the, the ethics, the aesthetics. A culture is really the collective beliefs of anything that's important. That's the way that is. So ethics, um, the uh, wellness, uh, aesthetics, all these things uh, that, that are important in life, that's the culture. So in a culture, if being thin is a sign of poverty and a sign of something that's not beautiful, then <clears throat> you want to gain some weight. In India, men, uh, as they prosper, they develop a, a belly. They have a belly, and that's good. Here would be you're out of shape in the United States. So it, it's very cultural. But that affects the biology. And what you were talking about with the uh, uh, menopause, <clears throat> in some countries like South America and other countries, they call it bochorno, which means the shame. When they have the, uh, the, um, the hot flashes, they call them the shames. And even the doctors, although, although they know it's hormonal, <clears throat> they'll, they'll say um, she's exhibiting symptoms of shame instead of saying hot flashes. Well, shame, we know, causes inflammation. When somebody shames you, you secrete molecules of inflammation. So women in South America who, and even in the United States, they don't call it shame, but it's something that they're, they're a bit uh, embarrassed about the hot flashes and all that. 
Well, then the women in, in South America and, and places that consider to be a negative thing <clears throat> will have greater inflammation, lower self-esteem, um, more hormonal imbalances, more pain, depression, and all these other things. So you would think, well, that's hormonal. But then, as you mentioned, in Japan and other countries in, in Asia, they call it, in Japan, they call it konenki, which means the second spring. The woman goes to a place of wisdom, beauty, a sense of uh, resource for other women. Guess what? None of the symptoms, higher self-esteem, no depression, and looking forward to moving to that stage. So important, Mo, because I was thinking, those same rural African women have now become urbanized and are, are, are exhibiting all those metabolic problems. Right. And of course, they, they say it's because of their weight. It's not because of their weight. It's because they've moved to a culture where they no longer feel honored and revered. They feel shamed because of their weight. Yes. Yes, that's exactly what happens. And um, it, the, the culture, when you go into a new culture, it could be in, in anthropology, they call it hegemony, which is a forced belief system, or acculturation, which is a gradual belief system with, with your consent, or the enculturation, which is what you bring from your culture and you keep. But when you get that hegemony, which is uh, that... Uh, especially in South Africa because of the changes. And look, over here you were beautiful, now here you're overweight and it's bad for your health. What happens, you begin to secrete the hormones according to the stress. You begin to see yourself as ugly, which means that you get depressed and depression has biology and on and on and on. After a while, then the uh, overweightness becomes a problem for you rather than an asset. Uh, so, those, so it's very important to see when you go into another culture how you begin to assimilate. Women, for example, 60 years ago, it was unheard of that, that women would have uh, cardiovascular problems. Women have become masculinized and now they're equal with cardiovascular problems with men because women are women and men are men. We're different uh, and, and we are different. Our biology is different. You don't want to be, uh, and I don't mean in a sexual way, but you don't want to be ontologically feminized if you're a man or ontologically masculinize if you're a woman, independent of your sexual, sexual preference. It's, it's the consciousness that you have about yourself. And that's what happens. That's what uh, these illnesses that are created. Uh, there's some men that have been so feminized, not again, not in a sexual way, in Denmark, that there, there's a, a, an, an increased incidence of, of breast cancer in men, which was unheard of, because you, 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 you buy the hologram, hologram of what's going on. Without knowing well, there's, there's also a phenomenon known as man boobs, where men actually develop breasts. Yes. Um, and again, it's part of that cultural shift that we're seeing. It's really yes. interesting. Yes. Uh, for example, if you, if you don't masculinize yourself, I don't mean macho, because people get misunderstood. Oh, you're talking about homosexual. I'm not talking about sexual preference. I'm talking about the hologram. If you become less and less masculine-like, and, and whether you're homosexual or heterosexual, you have, you have some decrease of testosterone, and that decrease of testosterone increases breast. So uh, it, it, has a, it has effects. It has, I don't mean you have to be a macho. You have to be who you are and, and, and live that hologram of who you are, uh, celebrating it rather than beating it up, as you're told uh, in many ways. Uh, I've done, for example, I've done in San Francisco, I did a workshop for, for gay men. And I said, look, you have to get out of that gay consciousness because you're more than gay. Some of them had gay dentists, gay doctors, gay attorneys, gay friends. I said you you have a lot more to offer than your gayness. Your gayness is a way of life and your and your sexuality, but you're a human being who has much more than that. And they understood. They could see that that it wasn't about anything about their their homosexuality. It, and part of they have to do it because. There's a lot of marginalizing and there's a lot of uh, criticism, so they have to protect themselves. Any, any minority has to protect themselves. Uh, so, but it's important to see that we're human beings beyond our race and our sexual preference and beyond our ethnicity. We're homo sapiens. That's it. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting how I think that our emotions play through our biology. So I found myself, I'm, I'm busy rereading my grandfather's, um, he, he kept a diary. 
And so I've got these big, thick tomes of his that I'm reading through. Oh, and one of the okay. things that struck me about him is that he had such a biology of worthiness. Um, yes. You know, when I, when I think about your work, every page that I read, there's just a sense of I am worthy. And I'm really interested in how we maintain our worthiness and how that plays and signals ourselves. Well, that, that's exactly right. You're describing your grandfather in a way that from the book, as you know, from the Mind Body Code, um, they, they have what, what my mentor, George Solomon, called healthy narcissism. They think that everybody loves them and they think they're wonderful, but they're able to admire other people without envy. That's a, that's a quality that needs to be developed. One of the causes of health is to be able to admire without envy. And that's a really powerful thing. You can see it with the Buddhists when they talk about uh, uh, the four immeasurables, about uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the joy of, of other people, uh, empathic joy of other people's triumphs and so forth. That's really important. So why is it important? And what, and what happens with our, our culture teaches us a false uh, humbleness. A little girl will say, Mommy, look how pretty my dress looks. Look how, look how smart I am. No, no, no. You never say you're smart. You never say you're pretty. You wait for people to tell you, and then you deny it. So, you, so you're taught to exceed and do well and everything, but once you notice it, you, got, you have to deny it. Yeah. I love your hair. Oh, I haven't washed it in three days. I like your shirt. Oh, it's real old. See, it's killing the, the joy of the gratitude. Yeah. And when, I, when I do a workshop, somebody will say, that was brilliant what you said. I say, yes, it is, because I'm brilliant. And, I, and I'll say, you know why? Because we're co-authoring brilliance. If you, if, if you see my brilliance, means because you're brilliant too. Yeah. And that is a subculture that I try to create with my books and with the book studies and things that I do on that, to teach that. You never apologize for your greatness because it's a gift. So centenarians, if you, there was one 102 year old woman. I said, you're really a beautiful woman. She was a beautiful woman. And she said, oh, I know, thank you. I've always been beautiful. Ever since I was a little girl, I was beautiful. How refreshing that is. Yeah, the culture will say, oh, that's narcissistic, that's conceited. No, that's a self-acceptance. So your grandfather was aware of that and he owned it and he had no apologies for it. And he had and great it, admiration for people around him. You know, that's, that's right. another it's thing inclusive. that keeps coming out for me is how much he sort of acknowledged and appreciated other people around him. That's, that's a healthy narcissism. It's inclusive. I went to Cuba to study some centenarians. And it's not because of the revolution. They were there before the revolution. The revolution now has, has dropped uh, the, uh, the, they're living 60 to 65 years in, in Cuba now. It's not good. The deprivation of food and anyway but this man uh they gave a party to him, and so he comes to the party and there were some women so he comes up to me in spanish of course and he says have you noticed how the women are looking at me they love me so you think okay whether they whether it's true or not there's a biology but then look at the the inclusiveness and that he said then did you notice how beautiful they are you see inclusive narcissism like your grandfather, they include their beauty without. Now, a, a, a pathological narcissist would say, Look how beautiful they are. I'm going to manipulate them. Instead of, Look how beautiful they are. They're beautiful like me. Yeah. That's, that's the inclusiveness. And compassion, the same thing. If you don't have any compassion for yourself, you can't, you can't have any compassion. There are groups, political groups, that doesn't right or left, that doesn't matter that they have only exclusive compassion. They're compassionate with people that agree with them. And they have rage for people that don't agree so much for compassion. Compassion is compassion inclusively, which means that for all. Yeah. Uh, and those are the things that, that our culture will teach us, will teach us to be unhealthy by the things they teach us and to live as long as the culture says you're gonna live. Yeah. I also noticed with my grandfather that he had very high levels of tolerance, but he had great boundaries. You know, of course, he, that's right there. That's another cause of health. See, you're 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 uh, <clears throat> describing all of the causes of health that I found. Causes of health, and that is that they are flexible, but they know how to set their limits. 
and I'll give you another example. You may have read it in one of the books. This is an, an Argentinian, uh, or, or not an Argentinian, a man who was going to Argentina, a, uh, a centenarian. And he, was, he loved tango. So I said, can I see you uh, Saturday? He said, yeah, sure, because they're very open. And then I said, at nine o'clock? Nope, at nine o'clock I have tango lessons. Two o'clock. They set limits. What happens with not setting limits? This is not a cost, there's a correlation. But people who have a propensity for cancer to have a propensity for not setting good limits and being caretakers at the expense of themselves. That's not causing cancer. That's helping the gene expression of helplessness. Uh, so those are all the things you're telling me, all the things that I've picked up on the causes of health from Centenary. Omar, you were speaking about Impala and what that did to cancer. The immune system works bipolar, bimodal. Empowered or disempowered? If it's disempowered, the population of natural killer cells and other uh, cells that, that fight cancer and, and, and pathogens drops, not only does it drop, but it becomes less efficient, less efficient in, in, in fighting pathology. That's one thing. The other is that when you are in helplessness, and, and I'll define helplessness and empower, empowerment because people talk about empowerment and they don't define it. It's very simple. As you know, in biocognition, you take complexity and you make it simple. Einstein said, if you can't explain something in a very simple way, you don't know what you're talking about. So that, <laughs> that have to make sure that it's clear. Empowerment means you have access to resources to overcome a challenge, and you take that access. You use the resource. So it's agency. It's whether you do it or not. Helplessness is no access to resources to overcome a challenge or choosing not to use the access that you have to resources. So the immune system has access to resources, but if you take the resources away, which is the, the strength of, uh, of, the, of the cells and all that, then it can't do it and it goes into helplessness and helplessness then is an open uh, door for disease to express whatever your family predispositions are there or to pick up any pathogen that's going on around. Like for example, the COVID, People are living in fear. It's hysterical. You have to be cautious, but not hysterical. Yeah. Be vigilant, but not so That's fearful right. that you're actually dropping your immune system and saying, come and get me. That's right. Come and get me. Uh, and, uh, I use a mask only when I need to. If I don't need it, I don't use it. Yeah. I'm cautious. I keep my distance and everything, but I don't live in fear. Yeah. There's, uh, here in Tennessee, it's open. You can go to restaurants and, and they have 50% capacity. I go to a restaurant. I, take my mask off and I eat, it's fine. Yeah. Um, because you, you have to have herd immunity, which I mean, we, viruses have been around longer than we have. They've been around for millions of years. They come and they go. Do you have to be cavalier about it? No, you have to be cautious about it, but know that they come and they go. Otherwise, every time there's a virus, do you shut down the economy and, and turn it into a, uh, uh, a fifth world country? You can't. You have to have herd immunity. So for example, let me give you a real practical example since we're in COVID times. Um, 10 people are in a room and nine have already overcome the virus and they have what's called herd immunity. They have immunity to the virus. That person in the room is very safe from getting the virus because they're with people that, that have herd immunity. Now, the opposite would be you have a person with uh, the virus and uh, the rest of the people have not had the virus. The probability of spreading that because there's no herd immunity is extremely high. So herd immunity is one of the protections that we have in order to protect ourselves naturally. Yeah. Uh, in the United States, there have been, the, the reason you have more cases is because there's more, uh, uh, more testing and 30 to 40% is false positive. So when you look at the uh, countries that have not been so hysterical as the United States, you find that their death rate, because they don't, they, you have to look at the, uh, at the infection rate, but you have to look at the, the, the rate of the death to the total population. The total death in the United States is 0.0006%. And it in keeps dropping. That's right. And, and, and countries that have been less careful it's 0.0006%. Viruses have a, have, have a, a periodicity, have a period, period, uh, periodicity, and, they, and you have to be cautious. 
But if you shut down and you create a petri dish at home, you increase immunological problems, um, family violence, depression, suicide, economic problems, and, uh, and, and, and drug abuse. I think that people need to be cautious, but they need to be aware that this is not the first virus that's been around. Uh, and, and, and you have to understand that, that it'll come and it'll go, so be cautious. But if you go into herd hysteria, what you're doing is you're inviting the probability of the, of the, of the uh, virus. But this virus is very uh, safe for children. For example, the, the flu <clears throat> is very, very dangerous for, for children. But this virus, children, uh, they're not good carriers. And if they get it, 99.9% uh, .9 are of, uh, of survival. If you get it as an adult, any age, if you're healthy, 98.9% .9 of surviving. You die mostly with you have some comorbidity that was already setting you up for anything to come in. And by the way, centenarians are the fastest growing segment of the population in the United States. They're, they're close to 100,000 now. And by the year 2050, uh, everyone that's born is going to have a more than 50% chance of being a centenarian. It's not just because of medicine. It's because of the consciousness that we're developing, the things that we're learning about ourselves and our food and, and other things. Yeah. So, so my book is based on three different population groups, what I call extreme survivors, so people who have good health over the age of 100, extreme shifters, which are multiple personality disorders, I'm going to say disorders in brackets, and extreme believers, people like firewalkers. And so what I wanted to ask you is, there's a guy, Dr. Bennett Braun, who has, um, he studies multiple personality disorders in Chicago. And he has one patient who has 15 different personalities. And in all of them, this man is deathly allergic to orange juice. But the minute he shifts into the one consciousness known as Timmy, they can literally watch real time as these blistery hives that are all over his body disappear completely. He hasn't changed his diet. He hasn't been to the gym. He hasn't lost weight. He hasn't taken allergy medication. All he's done is to shift his consciousness and his biology has shifted alongside. And I wonder how you would explain that in terms of biocognition. Do you think there is a way to explain it? Well, yes, because uh, multiple personalities could be a disorder or someone who has some really good mystical uh, abilities to shift consciousness. and and. All of, the, all of the markers of strictly DNA uh, have been completely <clears throat> debunked by multiple personalities. Even eye, eye color, which is a primary uh, um, um, heredity, uh, one personality could have brown and the other one has green. Uh, one can have uh, diabetes, the other one doesn't. So what these people is, what they have learned is to shift not only consciousness, to shift the, the, the hologram, the bioinformational hologram, and everything shifts with it. So these people could be doing workshops and teaching us how to do it. <laughs> uh, well, that's why I think, you know, if we shift, because I know that you speak about um, fast forwarding rather than, you know, reverse. Yes. And, and I wonder if they aren't shifting in a way that would be really helpful to us, if we could learn how to shift our biology the way that they do through this disorder. And that's why I say, I don't want to call it a disorder because in some ways, I think it's that it's a disorder. We, it's we it's a, it's a consciousness condition, yeah. Well, yeah, and with the feed forward, what I do, uh, just like centenarians do things naturally, I try to put them into a, a way of ap applying it. And just like multiple personalities can do things naturally, I try to bring it in and see how we can replicate. And one of the ways is that there's, uh, a, uh, a philosopher that I admired very much, um, Hans Wehinger, who is a mathematician, a physicist, and a, and a philosopher, and he wrote about the, uh, the as-if reality, yeah. that we don't see reality. We see chunks of reality, and one is an as-if, the other one's another as-if. So if there's such a thing, then you can choose your as-if, but you can't choose it in the present mindset because your mindset is already constrained. So in the feed forward, what I do is I, I have people go into a state of contemplativeness and then bring them out into some future event that they create. And in that future event, they don't have any, and you have to practice, you have to learn it. You don't have any expectations. You don't have any, 
uh, including the, the biology. And then you live out, you play out that part. You experience it, you embody it, and then you bring it back. You come back from the future and you embody it and then begin to live as if, and things begin to change. Mm -hmm. I love so that. And I also love the experiment that you and Dr. Northrup are doing where you ask someone to pose. Can you tell us a little bit more about yes. that? <laughs> And we've, we've seen a lot of change. I mean, it's really incredible. Well, no, it's not incredible. It's credible. That's another thing in the language. We say incredible we don't, when we don't believe something that's really beautiful about ourselves or someone else. It's incredible how you have cured yourself <laughs> because the, the, the system says it's not credible. So it's very credible. So s simply borrowing from uh, Ellen Langer's and then bringing in more biocognition. What we do is we have people uh, have their phone, their cell phone, and put a picture of them 20 years younger. But and now we know from all the other research and mistakes that were made, it has to be a picture, not when you were younger only, but when you were happy and younger. Because if you were physically abused at 20, you don't want that because it has the archives of that. So it has to be young and good times. And you put it on your phone. Then you take a picture of yourself today. Take a picture of your iPhone, you do a selfie. and what you do is throughout the day, you look at the picture when you were 20 years younger and you begin to reminisce, on, reminisce with, with embodiment. Oh, I used to have this level of energy. Okay, how does that feel this level? I used to feel so beautiful. How does that feel? How does that always? And then for the rest of the day, you act as if you were that person. The as if is very important if it's embodied. All thoughts will come in. No, nope, that's not me. You're playing, you're playing a game, but a game that has biological consequences. You do it three, two or three times a day. Then you look at your picture of the day before. In seven days, you take another picture and you're gonna see some incredible differences. You're gonna see your eyes would widen, uh, your jaw will tighten, the uh, uh, stress mark will be relieved, and your facial expression will fall on, on what's called base smile. Base smile, not like this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you'll see how that works. We've done it with hundreds of people. And it's really powerful. And it's not Botox. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper than Botox. It is, but you have to live it. You have to live it. You can't, and, and of course, if you're living and say, well, I'm not really uh, 30 anymore. Okay, but what is the energy of when I was 30? Uh, an example, when, when, I, when I was 19, I had to take, I started college and I had to take a, a test of swimming. I did two laps and I almost vomited. I swim half a mile now. And I'm only 102, so that's not bad. Well, I don't know if you're 102, but I do know this. I think you've got the wisdom age, because I think of wisdom age. I don't think of age. I think you've got yeah. the wisdom age of about 1,002. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, you reminded me of something. The next book that I'm writing, which will come out in, in January, it's called The Phoenix Self in Search of Methuselah. And it's a it's a novel like the Men from Autumn, as you know, the Men from Autumn is a novel. The Men from Autumn, isn't it? Yes, it is. And and the Men from Autumn is a foundation for my bestseller, not a nonfiction. It was it, it's really the characters living out biocognition. Mm -hmm. In the Phoenix Self, some of the characters from the the Men from Autumn find that uh, that Methuselah was not a singular, but it was a plural. Methuselahs were a group. It's all made up. But then I use all of the information that I have on longevity. And then I, I, there are five attainments to reach what I call 130, which is the Methuselah threshold. When you reach 130, you have access to information to live as long as you want. Wow, it's, it sounds fantastic. But based on, if you, if you follow the five attainments, you may not live to 130, but you're sure as hell going to live a lot longer because they're the foundations of what I learned about centenarians. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And more important than that, Maria, it's, it's not about living long. What you teach is about having a health span that matches your lifespan, no matter That's how right. long it is. And so That's if right. we can expand the lifespan, but with the health span to go with it, you know, who wants to be 102 and be decrepit and sit around the table and discuss right. all your ailments? That's right. That's no way. And I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of people, if I tell people, don't you want to live uh, to be 100? 100? What sick and but that's a mindset. No, a hundred with the health span that you have now. You you, you want to live life with meaning. 
that's why I never studied centenarians who were in, in nursing homes with uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, aids to, to, to keep them alive. No, no, that's, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the ones that are healthy. Many of them live alone, or if they live with a family, it's because of a family issue, not because of any kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, deficiencies or anything like that. They're very independent. My mother lived to be 97. And she, she would quote uh, a number that she had from, I can't remember what it was, but 13 digits. I couldn't do that. Um, and and it, so, but she was, she had all the independent, and she decided to go around at 97. I said, do you, you um, and it was, she was very healthy. I said, don't you want to be a sentinel? No, I've not been around long enough. I want to go see my father. That was it. And she died, and the second day in the hospital, gone. Nothing wrong with her. Well, you know, my That's... grandfather, up until the age of 100, was still getting down on the floor playing with his grandchildren. And yeah. he literally yeah. got into bed one night and just shed his physical cloak. And he'd been to hospital yeah. twice in his entire life. Yes, that's right. And that's how they are. That's yeah. how they are. You, you should have, well, I, I shouldn't say you should avoid doctors, but you should avoid uh, <clears throat> overdoing the medical system. If you, need, if you have a heart attack, you go. You don't go to a shaman or you, you, you take care of things. You be, be reasonable. But every time there's a little thing going on in your life, don't go because they're gonna find something wrong and they're gonna give you medication and they're gonna give you all kinds of things because that's what they know, not that they're bad, but because they know that the only way that they can help is by uh, interfering. Now, uh, our, our medical system in the US is very intrusive, very industrial. So doctors, I think in the 23rd century are gonna be educators of teaching you how to do things yourself with the technology and everything, but they're not gonna be interfering that much with uh, medications and, uh, and, and taking organs out and things like that because it'll be unnecessary once they know the science of it. Yeah, wonderful. So Maria, tell everybody where they can find you and tell them about your fantastic work that you're doing. Like at the moment, I'm in your group where you're discussing the man from autumn and every- Oh, yes. So tell everybody about some of your work. I know you do corporate work. Um, you've got all your incredible books. And tell us a little bit more about the Biocognitive Institute that you formed. Yes, the Biocognitive Institute is very simple. You go to um, Google and either biocognitive.com or biocognitiveculture.com. And there's quite a bit there. Or the empowerment, uh, empowermentcode.org. Uh, and that is about the, uh, the corporate. So what I do, with biocognition is I, I introduce culture into mind-body communication. Mind-body do not communicate in a vacuum. They, they communicate with a culture that shapes the reality. With the corporations, I work with Fortune 100 corporations and others, teaching their executives so they can create the culture to make decisions the way the immune system does. Mm -hmm. It makes hundreds of thousands of decisions a second without consulting the brain. And that's the kind of thing that I teach you how to create organizations, whether it's a corporation of 30,000 employees or yourself. Actually, you're the CEO of 50 trillion cells. So you're quite, you have a big company. Uh, so it applies to the individual or it applies to organizations because I bring psychoneuroimmunology, anthropology, and cultural um, neuroscience in. So those three things will say, okay, when people get together, what do they do? That's anthropology. When they get together and what they do, what happens to the, to the brain and what happens to the rest of the body, uh, psychoneurology. So bringing all, the, all those things together teaches empowerment and it teaches you the power that the culture has to make you sick, but also to heal you either way, depending on what you do. Maria, so, uh, thank you so much. Yo, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. And I'm glad that you're in the group. It'll be fun. Once we finish this group, we're going to do a, a group study on the Mind-Body Code. Wonderful. So. It's such an incredible book. Everybody should read it. So um, I'll be putting some links into this interview as well so that people can find you. Great. Thank, thank you so you much. So and much and congratulations for your book and, and the work that you do. You, you know biocognition very well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mario. Have a wonderful you day. Okay. Bye-bye then. Thank you.